Uh, if are you it able is to, unsolver, are you able to yeah, see yeah. the presentation now? Yeah, I am able to see it now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ryan, yeah. can I not do both things? Like I don't think you can see them while you're presenting. Oh. So, um, you'll be able to hear them. Mm -hmm. If you keep talking, uh, they can hear what you have to say. You can move through the slides to them, or if you, you can even start your slideshow somewhere. Um, presentation. You go into present mode from there. Just look for it. Or you can just flip through the tabs here. And you can keep explaining if them and ask them if they have questions. Okay, so right now, can you stop uh, sharing and tell okay. me how I'm supposed to share it? Okay. Um, you just go back to Google Chrome. Yeah. Um, but right now you can stop sharing. Yeah, that's the that's stop okay. sharing. Yeah. Now you're not presenting anymore. If you want to present again, present now feature. Oh, okay. Just Fine. present now. Go to Google Right. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. Sorry about that, Mr. Rao. So, so are we good to go? Uh, we're good to go. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I welcome all to this uh, webinar. I'm very thankful to our friend Durga for uh, fetching us uh, while Shaula. After reading about uh, her uh, short biography, I thought that we found a fantastic person to speak to us about the important issues of, uh, especially of course, she is going to speak uh, on the you know, pronouncements, judicial pronouncements and meaning of consent. So, uh, I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, 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 we are very happy that uh, we are able to get you to talk to us. Thank you uh, for having yeah. me. Yeah. So, uh, this is part of the International uh, Women's uh, Day celebrations. On that day, we could not uh, get the uh, time uh, of uh, Advocate Chavla. So, today, we are uh, she agreed to speak to us on 13th. Today, uh, we are very happy uh, to have her with us. Uh, a few words about her. Jepail Chawla uh, is the founder of the Just Contractors, a Delhi-based boutique law firm specializing in arbitration and corporate law. It is country's first and only all-women law firm. The firm, since its inception, has been recognized for its efforts and was recently photographed by Miss Lynn Johnson, the Pulitzer nominee photographer of the National Geographic, as part of the celebrations of the 100th year of anniversary of the U.S. suffrage movement. Prior to founding the Just Contractors, Pyle was partner with HSA Advocates. She has also served as head of the legal for Racket Ben Kaiser from 2004 to 2007 and in-house counsel for Coca-Cola India for nearly a decade. Pyle is an alumnus of the University of Chicago, Faculty of Law, Delhi University, St. Stephen's College and Modern School. Pyle's epic battle against a corporate gain has been an inspiration to many. Her life and work were captured in a form of a short biopic by Tapsia Productions. The film was adjudged the best film in the category of women empowerment at the Kolkata Source International Film Festival 2016. Pyle was recently featured as part of the Jaipur Writer Shorts at the Jaipur Literature Festival 2021. She was now named as one of the thinkers to watch for watch out for by Forbes. India in 2015. Apart from legal practice, Pyle is a keen writer and writes regularly on myriad legal issues, particularly arbitration and feminism for newspapers and other reputed publications. Pyle is a Rotary Scholar, a Russell Packer Fellow and a recipient of University of Chicago International House Grant. She serves on the board of directors of the Nani Palkewala Arbitration Center. With this short introduction, I, I once again proud to say that we are, uh, uh, we, uh, we are able to uh, bring uh, Payal Chawla to speak to us on uh, 
on the meaning of the consent and judicial pronouncements. Pail Chawla. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Mr. Rao, can we have everyone's cameras yeah. on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can we? Uh, I'd like to see who all are here. Okay. I, 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 my, my, a mix my, of men and women, which is very heartening to see. So is yeah, everyone yeah. here from uh, the Department of History? Or? Yeah, mostly, mostly, mostly. Okay. Uh, yeah, mostly, yeah. I, 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 my colleague uh, who's doing this technical support I already heard your request. I think he's <laughs> requesting all of us to all of them to uh, you know appear on their cameras. I think right now. <laughs> so probably in course of time they saw their faces. So probably we can go on now and uh, yeah. Uh, the yeah. idea was to you know have a bit of an interactive session because uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the meaning of consent yeah. in the context of uh, sexual assault mm. and rape laws. And okay. uh, so I just wanted to begin by giving a slightly a trigger warning because uh, some of the language that I'm going to use today uh, is a bit explicit um, and it might be offensive to some of the people. Uh, so and also my views are, you know, a bit radical. So if uh, anybody please feel free to disagree with the views, um, I'm more than happy to have a discussion. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, begin uh, by showing you the uh, definition of rape uh, mm. under Section 375 uh, of the Indian Penal Code. Uh, so just give me a second to uh, bring up the presentation. Yeah. Um, All right. Can everybody see? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We are, uh, yeah, see, we are seeing it now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to take a minute to slowly read uh, the definition of rape, so you all can follow uh, with me. A man is said to commit rape if he penetrates his penis to any extent into the vagina, mouth, urethra, or anus of a woman, or makes her do so with him or any other person, or inserts to any extent any object or part of the body not being the penis into the vagina the urethra or anus of a woman makes her do so with him or any person or manipulates any part of the body of a woman so as to cause penetration into the vagina urethra anus or any part of the body of a woman or makes her do so with him or any other person or applies his mouth to the vagina, anus, urethra of a woman, or makes her do so with him or any other person. Now, the important uh, um, portions for our uh, matter today, I have highlighted in color red. Under the circumstances falling under any of the seven descriptions, the first one, as you can see right at the end, is against her will. Secondly, without her consent. Thirdly, with her consent, when her consent has been obtained by putting her or any person whom she is interested in the fear of death or of hurt. Fourthly, with her consent, when the man knows that he is not her husband and that her consent is given because she believes that he is another man or whom she believes herself to be lawfully married. Fifthly, with her consent, when at the time of giving such consent, by reason of unsoundness of mind or intoxication or administration by him personally or through any uh, 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 through another of any stupefying or wholesome substance, she is unable to understand the nature and consequences of that to which she gives consent. Sixthly, with or without her consent, when she is under 18 years of age. Explanation. Penetration is sufficient to constitute the sexual intercourse necessary for the offense of rape. Now look at the exception. Sexual intercourse by a man with his own wife, then wife not being under the age of 15 years of age, is not rape. Uh, this uh, 15 years that you're seeing here is now 18. Uh, that came about by a judicial pronouncement. Uh, now, I wanted to just get in briefly uh, into what each of these mean. So I, I will come back to uh, the first two, which is against her will 
and without her consent. But let's start with three, which says with her consent, when her consent has been obtained by putting her or any person in whom she is interested in the fear of death or hurt. So here, this it's not really rocket science. It's basically, uh, you know, if the rape of a, uh, of a woman is is done uh, by putting her uh, in the bodily uh, bodily hurt or death, so which means consent here is not freely given. And in the matter of Himachal Pradesh versus uh, Mango Ram in 2000, a three-judge bench had held. Submission of the body under fear or terror cannot be construed as a consented sexual act. Consent for the purpose of Section 375, which is the section on rape, requires voluntary participation, not only after the exercise of intelligence based on knowledge of significance or moral quality of the act, but after having exercised the choice between resistance and assent. Whether there was consent or not is to be ascertained only of a careful study of the relevant circumstances. Hmm. So uh, this exception, I think, is uh, easily discernible to everyone. Does anybody have any questions so far? And I can proceed uh, ahead. I don't think so. No, please. Right. So the next one, uh, this is a bit, uh, if you see the way this, this one reads, it says, with her consent. So you actually have the woman's consent here when the man knows uh, that he is not her husband. So in, in this particular instance, there is the woman is married. However, uh, the man who is, uh, is is having sexual intercourse with the person is not her husband. And, and the woman has given consent because she believes that this man is either her husband or she believes that she's lawfully married to him. So the instances that I could think of would be, uh, for instance, if a victim is blind uh, and she believes that the man that she's having sexual intercourse with is actually her husband, but he, he's, a th he's not her husband. Or if a married woman, for in instance, pretends to, to marry a woman uh, and make her falsely believe that they are married, or conducts a false marriage uh, with her, uh, which is not really a marriage, and has sexual intercourse with her, This, all of these instances would amount to her not having con given consent freely or consent with regard to that particular man. Now, uh, um, I actually you know, um, will give you a, a real life example. Uh, but this has happened in the United States, and in that uh, instance, uh, the parties were not married. So that example may not strictly apply here. But uh, this was, um, I think, in regard to. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Can this be called as a manipulated consent or something? Uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, so the in the example that I was going to share with you at Purdue University. Um, there's this uh, young girl who's uh, you know uh, sleeping in the dorm of her boyfriend mm -hmm. and uh, uh, another person comes there and slips into bed with her mm -hmm. uh, and she bona fide believes that mm -hmm. uh, it was her it was her boyfriend in with whom she was indulging in the sexual act and this fact was in fact admitted uh, by the perpetrator Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you were to use this exact example in the Indian context, it won't apply strictly to this particular subsection uh, mm -hmm. because in this example, uh, the person is not married. But hypothetically, if you see if it were a man husband wife relationship and a third person came in and pretended mm -hmm. that uh, he was the man and falsely induced the woman to believe that she was having sexual intercourse with her husband, that even would amount to rape. Mm -hmm. Uh, now these two, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but but a woman is, you know, say for normally intelligent and thinking woman, understand who is who, uh, who is who. Uh, I think uh, except in the, in, even any case, I think any context, uh, only in case of blind or if the woman is under some influence, only someone can pretend to be husband and uh, you know, conduct an intercourse and a sexual intercourse. Uh, so you're right, but that's a question of evidence. Uh, I'm uh, trying to explain situations right now. 
where let yeah. us assume that all the facts that I am presenting are entirely yeah. true. And you're yeah. entirely right that, you know, uh, this would be one of the defenses uh, that the accused would take up saying that you know, she's an intelligent woman. Uh, she she knew at all times what she was doing. So uh, that would certainly be uh, one of the, the defenses that the accused would take up. Yeah, yeah. But if we, I'm just saying that in, in a context uh, where the Purdue University example that I'm taking, uh, mm -hmm. there it was admitted by uh, the accused uh, that the woman had no way to discern whether mm -hmm. it was uh, her, her boyfriend or him. Mm -hmm. And now in that example, uh, and if the parties were married, it would come within that particular subsection. Mm. Now in this, uh, in these two cases are also uh, fairly uh, easy to understand, which is with her consent when at the time of giving such consent by reason of unsoundness of mind. So if the, yeah. the victim yeah. is of unsound mind, or like mm. you were rightly saying, intoxicated, yeah, yeah. Or has been administered uh, personally mm. by another uh, party, let's say, uh, you know, a date rape drug, or, or yeah. a place where she, you know, she's not in her senses. Uh, she's yeah. able to understand the nature and consequences of what exactly she's consenting to. Mm, mm, mm. Or if the person, if the victim is uh, under the age of 18. Uh, yeah. Now, in, in a, uh, when uh, and I would like oh, everyone who's present here today to be able to understand that there is a distinction between an act of sexuality uh, and an act of rape. In both of the different markets, uh, rape is an act of violence. And uh, for there to be a sexual relationship between two people, that can only happen between two consenting adults mm. or uh, yes, only between two consenting adults. So the person must be adult and, and uh, over the age of 18 to be able to give informed consent. Mm. And there should be consent involved. So those are the two things. If there is somebody who's under age, they are not in a position to give consent. And that would amount mm. to statutory rape. No. Now, uh, in the context, uh, I do want to mention one case uh, which had happened uh, in 1972. I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to mention the case of Mathura uh, in 1972. A uh, young tribal uh, girl had been, uh, uh, you know, was in love with a, uh, a higher caste boy by the name of Ashok. And uh, her brother, uh, Gama, was opposed to the match. So what he did was, um, and she was a minor, so he uh, reported uh, this matter to the police and said that Ashok had actually kidnapped her. So uh, the police had called both sides of the family. So Ashok's family had been called and Gama and all had been called. And, mm. and while the, after the police heard both parties, they asked them to leave. But while they were leaving, uh, they asked Mathura to stay back. Mm. And uh, they then uh, these two uh, policemen by the name of uh, Tukaram and Ganpat, they take uh, Mathura back to, uh, you know, the courtyard at the back of the police station uh, mm. and they rape her. Uh, Ganpat actually uh, 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 penetrates, uh, uh, penetrates her. Uh, Tukara was too drunk so he digitally rapes her. Mm. Uh, the digital family, uh, digital as, a, as a not penile penetration. Uh, yeah. This is his fingers. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so um, uh, the family at this point is getting a bit agitated as to, you know, taking so much time. Uh, what are they, you know, talking to her? They're getting a little bit suspicious. And uh, these policemen, when they put off the lights of the police station, that's when they get very suspicious. And they come to the back of the police uh, station. Uh, anyway, uh, Martina emerges and she relates the story to them. They take her to the doctor who confirms that it had indeed been raped. So imagine their plight now that they go back to the same police station 
and they um, uh, you know have to get an FIR registered. The police obviously refuse to do so. So then there is a bit of a uh, commotion outside. They threaten to burn down the police station, and the FIR finally gets registered. Now uh, the sessions uh, court actually you know attacks her uh, her character. They actually assault it and say that Mathura was habituated to sex. And so therefore, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there was no rape. But mm -hmm. the matter then goes to the Bombay High Court. And the Bombay High Court takes a very, uh, very progressive view for the, you know, the 70s. And they actually say that there is a difference between consent and passive submission. And, and what they say is that you have to see the circumstances in which Mathura was at the time. Because here she is uh, in the police station, and uh, uh, the, the, there's a complaint by her family member against the man who she wishes to marry. And mm. uh, his, um, his uh, liberty depends on the very men who, are, uh, who have assaulted her and raped her. The, uh, anyway, unfortunately, the matter goes to the Supreme Court, and uh, the Supreme Court at the time, uh, you know, uh, says that uh, the fact that there were no injury marks on Mathura's body, uh, the, the the absence of these injury marks on the body goes a long way to indicate that the alleged intercourse was a peaceful affair. Now, what it happened, uh, I'm going to deviate a bit from the issue of consent, but just to tell you that uh, uh, post Mathura, uh, to uh, 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 Professor Upendra Bakshi of the Delhi University uh, had written to, yes. along with two other professors, wrote to the Supreme Court. And then there were impromptu, spontaneous protests countrywide, uh, mostly by women's organizations. And they pushed the government to come up with the, the very first reform in the law. And uh, now this becomes important to the debate uh, on consent, because what the, uh, the legislature at that time did was they made a category of aggravated rapes, which are, for instance, custodial rape, rape of a pregnant woman, uh, um, gang rape, statutory rape in all this the presumption then changes and uh, if a woman says that there was no consent it will be presumed that it was rape and uh, the burden of proof is now on the accused to show uh, that it wasn't rape and it was consensual and uh, uh, post Mathura, there is an entire history, but then that's a topic of another, uh, you know, uh, debate or uh, uh, conference. I I'm uh, today wanting to focus on the issue of consent. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, having said this, uh, I want to now uh, come to. Uh, Section 90, I'm going to go back to the presentation for a bit. If you just give me a minute. Yeah. If anyone has any questions in the meantime, please. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I think they are hearing what you are saying. They're, if they have, they'll ask. Right. So yeah. um, I don't know. How about, to... about this, uh, about this Madhura, and uh, is this... Uh, uh, after the reform that they suggested is the burden of uh, providing the proof that it is not consensual is only fell on the accused or the victim also supposed to uh, do something to prove that it is not consented uh, so uh, sorry i should have explained this uh, mm. the, as uh, post the reform that had come about which was uh, post mathura's case Mm -hmm. uh, and that that position is there even today, but there are uh, two categories of uh, of uh, of rape. There's regular yeah. rape and there's aggravated rape. In the mm -hmm. cases uh, which are defined as aggravated rape, which is uh, the category I had told you, custodial rape. So if a woman gets raped in the custody of the police, or okay. it's a gang rape. Yeah or a pregnant woman is raped or, or, or a minor girl is raped you know under the age of 18 it is presumed 
that it was rape and the burden of proof is on the accused to show otherwise but in regular okay. cases of rape yeah. uh, all of the categories yeah. that you know we we talked about here which do not fall within the offenses of aggravated rape those the burden of proof is still on the um, is on the prosecution to show that they were mm, yes. yeah so that burden doesn't change it, it, it only changes in cases of aggravated rape yeah so i was referring to only the only the prosecution only has to provide the proof uh, of non consent not the victim i was as i was referring the victim cannot be forced to uh, so it, any proof it, 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 really the prosecution because uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I was only referring to the prosecution here yeah, that's yes yeah, so i'm so sorry uh, i'm yeah. uh, i am going to just ask my son to uh, show the presentation again i seem to have lost how to do that yeah please 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 no no, no. it's not here okay. oh, oh, okay. this one uh, no oh, not no. this one the other one yeah, yeah. Thank you. And then can you shut the door, please? Yeah. So there's one more section, section ninety, uh, which I wanted to read out to you. It says a consent is not such a consent as is intended by any section of this code. If the consent is given by a person under fear of injury, we had already spoken about this. Yeah, or on the yeah, misconception yeah. of fact. Now you saw the, those words that I've highlighted, and if give, given, and if the person doing the act knows or has reason to believe that the consent was given in consequence of such fear or misconception, then again uh, the the remainder I'm not reading because we've already discussed insane person and uh, consent of a child. Now the reason mm. I was showing uh, uh, section ninety to you uh, was this. That um, you see, that I'm going to just stop presenting and I'll read out because most of uh, uh, this we can, you know, just have a discussion, and that's what I was planning to do. Yeah. Uh, just a moment, please. I'm so sorry. I'm having this difficulty with. Uh, uh, Not a problem. There are there are two categories I want to discuss on consent. Because these categories are very, they're gray areas. And, and I'm sure a lot of the men uh, that are here today will also have the same questions uh, as maybe uh, the women. Uh, and these are the, 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 the categories that you see, it's easy to, uh, to say that there is for all parties when parties are strangers to one another. For, for example, in the horrific uh, rape of Nirbhaya, where uh, all the parties, uh, the accused persons, were strangers to uh, Nirbhaya. Mm. So there, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of discerning whether it's rape or it's sex, uh, a consensual sex, there are no there are no blurring of the lines there. But Absolutely. there are many instances where the lines can be blurred, and that's what I want to discuss with you because. Uh, I want to give you the woman's perspective, how we feel about it, and I also want to hear what the men uh, feel about it because you know there are no uh, these can be very very the lines can be blurred, and often both sides have a perspective. So I'm hoping uh, that we can you know find some middle ground on that. Now section mm -hmm. ninety, where I had read to you the words misconception of fact, what typically the cases that come under this. Is uh, yeah. where uh, where a woman uh, has sexual intercourse with a man, giving consent, but uh, where the man has promised her marriage. Mm. Now, in the Indian context, there is a lot, uh, perhaps too much, uh, uh, weightage given to uh, sex within a marriage between people. That's also problematic because I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about marital rape also, uh, which is legal in India. But uh, I, I, we want I want to start by talking about those particular cases 
where a woman alleges that I had sexual con uh, relations with a man because I was under the bona fide uh, belief or he had promised me uh, marriage and therefore we had uh, sexual intercourse. Now, uh, in, uh, in 1913, the Madras High Court in the division bench had explained what the expression misconception of fact, uh, misconception of fact, which occurs in section 90, uh, what does it mean? But that was in the context of kidnapping. So it's a very, it's very easy uh, here to discern what had happened. So in this uh, case, what had happened was that uh, uh, one of the accused takes a young girl uh, uh, on the pretext from his from her guardian that he is going to take her to show um, uh, a festival. But after the mm -hmm. festival, he takes her away to another place and he um, uh, forcibly makes her get married to uh, the main accused. So here uh, the court said, we are of the opinion that the expression under a misconception of fact is broad enough to include all cases where consent is obtained by misrepresentation. So far, no difficulty with this, right? Mm -hmm, mm, uh, yeah. Misrepresentation should be regarded as leading to a, to a misconception of the facts with reference to which consent is given. So in this particular case, mm. there is no difficulty understanding. He gave consent for his daughter to be taken to a festival. He takes her, you know, gets her married. Uh, so there is definitely misconception of fact. Now, in the context of rape, uh, 375, the Bombay High Court in 1963 says consent given pursuant to a false representation that the accused intends to marry would be disregarded as consent given under misconception of fact. However, the Supreme Court uh, in 2003 has taken a slightly uh, more circumspect view. The court in Uday versus the state of Karnataka, the Supreme Court says that, look, uh, every case where somebody says that they were in love with, uh, 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 with the accused uh, and they have, they, uh, there, was a, there was a promise to marry at a later date, does, cannot always fall within the misconception of fact of Section 90. And each, uh, each matter has to be seen according to its own facts. And the court goes on to say, uh, must consider the evidence before it, surrounding circumstances, before reaching a conclusion, because each case has its own peculiar facts, which may have a bearing on the question whether the consent was voluntary or whether it was given under the misconception of fact. So, to your, uh, Mr. Rao, to what you were saying, uh, this is exactly what the court is saying. He said, we can't give a blanket order saying that this will always be misconception. We have to see the fact, yeah. we have to see the surrounding circumstances. And on a case by case, we will decide. Mm. And then it says, the court has gone on to say, it must also weigh the evidence keeping in view the fact that the burden is on the prosecution to prove each and every ingredient of the offense absence of consent being one of them. Mm. Yes. So now, you see, uh, uh, and I'm going to take obviously the woman's point of view now uh, and talk about consent in the context of the way women feel today. We feel uh, that if you see uh, the definition of consent in section 90, it's giving you uh, what is not consent? So the uh, the legislature has not said what is consent. They don't say it's an affirmative act by a woman where she says yes to every act uh, of, uh, of a sexual nature. You know, what they're saying is we're telling you what is not consent. So it's a bit uh, what... The way I, as a woman, see that is that women have no agency. We have no right to decide uh, whether we have any say in a sexual act or not. It's it's very paternalistic. It's uh, in the manner in which society speaks about us. Wo kisi ki hai, ya wo kisi ke. You all understand Hindi, I hope. 
and most of us not <laughs> no so oh she's somebody's sister she's somebody's mother you know be a little bit respectful it's almost as if women have no agency women have to uh you know uh, the 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 norm with which society approaches consent is to say that a woman has to play coy in a in a sexual act the first instance she should be like no not really maybe so when she mm. says no it means yes when she says maybe it also means yes mm. so yeah. it, it, uh, it, the decision making is sort of left to the man if she says no it, it's really up to the man to say no no it's all right let me cajole you let me uh, you don't really know Uh, i'm the one who's uh, you know deciding uh, how uh, how you have to behave uh, and uh, if a woman uh, she actually cannot be the initiator of a sexual act because if she is then she's slut shamed uh, and and therefore there is the lack of agency and uh, i'm now going to discuss with you uh, a very very uh, controversial case which happened um in september of 2017 which was decided by the delhi high court uh i must uh, i don't know if you all have heard of the matter of mehmood farooqi versus uh the state uh, government of uh, nct uh the, the facts in this case um you know are, are, are slightly explicit so please excuse me for that but it's important uh, for each of you to know the facts because this is the closest case that i could come where the lines are very very blurred mm. and and people will have you know uh, can have different perspectives i'll give you what my perspective is and uh, uh, please feel free to disagree now uh, in this particular facts of the case uh, uh, the the accused mr farooqi uh, is a is a well known uh, theater personality i think uh and uh the the victim in question oh, was a lady that uh, had come on a scholarship to india and uh, she was uh, studying in one of the universities here mr farooqi was married um the lady in uh, question had befriended both uh, the accused and his wife she was known to both of them uh the accused and the victim in this case developed a bit of a flirtatious friendship um it is uh, the admitted case uh, of both parties that on an instance uh, when the wife had stepped into the other room uh, the uh, the uh, the accused and the victim shared some kisses uh, on the on that fateful day uh, on which the rape was alleged to have happened <coughs> on that day the victim who was going for a marriage along with the accused and his wife um, and i think uh, of other people she had come to the accused's house uh, there was another gentleman uh, at the residence of the accused the wife was not there at the time and the accused was profusely crying like uh, like tears rolling down his uh, cheek the victim uh, actually goes and consoles him and in the process of consoling him uh, he reaches out to her to kiss her and it becomes then fairly uh, explicit it, it, now here is where uh, the the case of the victim was i stopped him i mm. said no uh, and uh, he then went on to pull down her trousers uh, and forcibly have oral sex with her she mm. says no and then it is the case of the victim that she says that i um, uh, faked an orgasm because i wanted him to stop Mm. I wanted this to stop and I was fearful for my life because uh, in my mind I was thinking about the Nirbhaya case mm -hmm. at that time uh and um after that uh, you know she uh, comes uh, 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 she she she's leaving she she calls herself a cab sits in the cab uh, goes home while she's going home she rings up a friend uh, relates the instant uh, incident to him and uh after this i think uh, the next to the uh, in a within a few days she sends an email uh, to the accused saying that what happened yesterday uh, was you know uh, uh went uh, beyond uh, 
what I had permitted, uh, you know, something to this effect. Uh, the accused actually writes her an email back saying, I'm sorry, which he later explains uh, during the, the, the course of the court, saying that he didn't really read the email. So he was apologizing because he th thought that she was upset because uh, not enough attention had been paid to her. And uh, uh, the second email that she sends uh, is actually read by the wife of the accused. Uh, where you know she's very upset and she has used profanity as well in that uh, email, uh, where the wife of the accused actually writes back saying, "I'm sorry uh, for the experience that you've had," and um, she then says that the accused has a, a bipolar disorder and he's in rehab at the moment. So these are the broad facts in a nutshell. Now, um, uh, the accused was actually, uh, you know, the sessions or the trial court had held him uh, uh, to be guilty. Uh, the matter came up before uh, the high court. Now, before the high court, uh, uh, there were many defenses that were taken, but I'm telling you the primary defense for our purposes today. They said that uh, the unwillingness uh, of the victim was only in her own mind and heart but she communicated something totally different to the appellant. And that was primarily because she you know, uh, fakes an orgasm or whatever. So he, mm -hmm. according to the accused, he believes that he has, that her consent is there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And if that were not so, the prosecution, prosecutors uh, would not have told the appellant that uh, he had gone too far that night. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there were some, uh, I have to say that the High Court made some great observations in the context of rape in general and in the context of what amounts to consent. Um, I have a problem personally, I don't, dis I don't agree with what the High Court has held, uh, but that's what I want to discuss with all of you because you know this is in such a gray area. So uh, I thought it would be a great case to be able to explain to everybody, you know, what is consent and where are the boundaries. But uh, let me read some of the observations that the court made. The court said, uh, so by the way, in this, the court actually held that uh, uh, though, uh, so one of the very important things that the court says in, in uh, Mehmood Feruki's matter is that uh, irrespective of uh, what the relationship between the parties is. Because even if they're in a consensual relationship, uh, it does not mean that there is a consent forever. Uh. So at each time that the parties indulge in a sexual act, consent must be there each time, which is a very, very important observation because Otherwise, you can have a situation where a, a prostitute can never be uh, be raped, and, and a woman has then no agency, right? So this was a very, very important observation, and um, uh, but I think that uh, so the court uh, actually um, uh, holds the accused not guilty, uh, primarily on the uh, on the fact of. Uh, 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 you know, that did the accused know that there was no consent or not? Uh, and to my mind, that gets a bit, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit blurry here because uh, you see the court doesn't deal with the instances where she actually says no initially. Uh, because uh, here when she has said no, and one of the things, and I'll come to it where the court says, but you know, no could mean yes. Mm -hmm. That's where the, the issue is. Because if the woman had said no, and it was clearly no, uh, the accused ought to have stopped there and then, and then had a hands-off approach to say, now when you give me affirmative consent, I'll only proceed then. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's happened here. So, which is why, in to my mind, uh, I don't agree with the uh, with the ruling of the court. But nonetheless, let me read out to you what the court has said. So, please bear with me. Yeah. It is not unknown that during sexual acts, 
one of the partner may be a little less willing or it can be said unwilling but when there is an assumed consent it matters not if one of the partners to the act is a bit hesitant such feeble hesitation can never be understood as a positive negation of any advances by the other partner and i have real difficulty with this because uh, sure. you see in, in an in a sexual act i get it that you know there may be uh, some amount of cajoling and uh, uh, you know sort of uh, to each partner but to you know say there was assumed consent uh in a, in particularly in a past situation between a man and a woman to say that there is assumed consent that to my mind is incorrect then uh, the issue with the word that feeble hesitation uh, it's really going back to the domain that i had talked about because women are expected to act coy so that's what the uh, in the accused's mind also it's okay if she is saying no she must be acting coy her, her no is actually a yes her maybe is actually a yes and we all i think men and women have to evolve to a point where we have to be able to say no means no and if a woman has said no unless there is an uh, from her side an affirmative categorical consent men should be able to back off and say no there after the court goes on to say instances of women, women behavior are not unknown that a feeble no may mean a yes see this is exactly what i was talking about if the parties are strangers the same theory may not be applied you see if they're strangers and it's all right uh if the parties are in some kind of prohibited relationship then also it would be difficult to lay down a general principle that an emphatic no would only communicate the intention of the other party mm -hmm. if one of the parties to the act is a conservative person and is not exposed to the various ways and systems of the world mere reluctance would also amount to a negation of the consent but the same would not be the situation when the parties are known to each other are persons of letters and are intellectually and academically proficient and if in the past there have been physical contacts in such a case it would be really difficult to decipher whether little or no resistance and a feeble no was actually a denial of consent uh again you know the blurring is because a lot of it is conditioning it's a lot of the way that we are grown up to think but it's about time that uh, you know we have this education where uh, men and women are able to uh, you know take the agency of uh, sexual acts within their own uh, hands there after the court says consent cannot also be analyzed without taking into account the gender binary you see this is this is greatly troubling there are differences between how men and women initiate and reciprocate sexual consent the normal construct is that the man is the initiator of sexual interaction he performs the active part whereas women is a woman is by and large non verbal uh, you're actually taking away the entire agency from a woman Yeah, I don't think so. That's it's that's a, perpetuating a cycle of uh, saying that the men only can be initiators and women cannot. Thus, gender relations also influence sexual consent because man and woman are socialized into gender roles, where influence which influence their perception of sexual relationships and expectation of their specific gender roles with respect to the relationship. However, in today's modern world. with equality being the buzzword such may not be the situation but thank yes, god for that yes there is i no think uh, if you if you yes. let me to say please mr that is not the case i think it in, in controlled cultures like ours or any other such controlled cultures the initiation of the woman in uh, uh, is actually not recognized as such you know, that's the point you know We, we do not know actually in uh, in indian sexuality whether women initiating or not even if the woman is initiating it is not publicly debated and discussed 
it's not a public knowledge we tend to believe that only male is initiator that's in it's actually a patriarchal construction of you know uh, uh, maleness but i don't think so in in, in rural uh, rural sexuality in urban sexuality there are uh, male, uh, female initiators but that is actually not considered as such it is not considered as such because women also feels that you know such an initi- women being an initiator is an actually shameful thing so it should not become a public knowledge and if uh, a male society we, uh, you know come to know that their women are initiators uh, the patriarchal society also would not want their uh, female as initiators you know they don't want uh, that becomes a public you know sort of a same also so therefore uh, uh, there is certainly huge amount of um, uh, female initiation in sexual uh, intercourse but that is actually corrupted and you know sort of you know it is uh, you know, controlled and the sto- entire story of women initiation is controlled because we don't uh, want such kind of women uh, uh, and out in the public you right mr rajan right because this entire that yes. shaming concept and you know is attached to the woman uh, uh, should mm-hmm. she be the initiator and mm-hmm. that's troubling because the entire conversation on con- consent is then uh, you know then this it perpetuates this oh, oh no is therefore a yes uh, mm-hmm. and, and you know then, then you ask questions like uh, uh, so why was she in the hotel room with him mm-hmm. uh, she could be in the hotel room because uh, she wanted to have a drink she could yeah. be in the hotel room because uh, you know they they perhaps it was okay for her to kiss someone but that yeah. uh, but so the point i'm trying to make is that consent at every level has to be has to be there it can also yeah. be that the uh, initial the sexual contact has begun and and she then says no and the man yeah, has to come you see yeah. Yeah, yeah my point is actually my point is actually when we talk about the modern radical women agency and the traditional uh, uh, traditional or what you say orthodox women agency when you try to say that the modern radical women agency is capable of uh, initiating and the you know, the traditional orthodox women agency is not capable of initiating in the sexual intercourse is actually a wrong understanding that's what i'm saying so both of course uh, the uh, the degree of radicality among the modern women as initiators has increased we have to understand that but also in the uh, uh, there is huge uh, huge amount of initiation is being done by the uh, 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 done by the women in rural uh, societies as in the pre modern societies also but we do not uh, know much about it that's what my point is so as far as the initiation is concerned i am not talking about consent here the initiation of only as we said pointed out only male are considered as initiators and female are considered as respondents that's it as you, you talked about it so but, Ms. Kao, yeah. what i'm talking about i'm talking about women as in, uh, initiators in the context of consent yeah yeah so, I, so my, i understand yeah, that. so my point is is simply this that yeah, yeah. uh consent a woman should have agency over her own body and sexuality absolutely and, absolutely. and uh, in the particular case the reason i gave you uh, spoke about the case of mehmood farooqi is because and i can see that that can be a very debatable issues on both uh, across the gender yeah, yeah. and by uh, by saying things like you know a yes could be a no or mm. a no could be a yes or a maybe yeah. is a yes or a man is generally the initiator so the, what we're then saying is a woman has no agency yeah that's what i'm saying oh that she cannot withdraw consent after the, the in the middle of the the sexual act so that, that that's my difficulty with the judgment but i'm happy to hear other views as well so um yes yeah, so th- this is primarily that what i wanted to discuss and i'm hoping that you know we can open it up to some questions and perhaps some discussion so even if someone has a comment to make please feel free to uh yeah so so we are stopping yeah. here as far as your presentation is concerned uh uh advocate Ch- pail chawla so have you stopped presenting so yes, can I have... okay okay so i invite questions now okay. sir right. i have a question sir yeah, yeah. 
uh ma'am actually uh, women are always blamed like uh, like their their dressing should change like that but i, I feel that uh, men uh, who see them that uh, that uh, view should change i feel ma'am so what is your opinion on that uh, should is it the is it really the reason of uh, the dress of women which causes all the things or uh, the view of men should change uh mr sundar could you just repeat part of that question i lost part of what you were saying so i heard some bits that should men change their views is yeah. that what you asked yeah, yeah. Uh, and yes. what was the bit about the woman yeah ma'am actually uh, the dressing is yeah. blaming the woman on the dressing yeah. instead of changing the views of men right so uh uh mr sundar you know in uh, uh, there was a there's a film that i always in all my lectures on uh, consent and rape and me too and uh, uh, i always say please go and watch the film uh, known as the accused uh, i don't know if you all have seen it it was in the 80s the film had come out but um, this is it's actually a true story uh, which they have made into a film where a woman is provocatively dancing in a bar and she is gang raped so uh, you know the perception the general perception of men is that if somebody is provocatively dancing it's a license to rape them or they're asking to be raped so if i was to take that extension of that is the same thing that if a woman is uh, wearing shorts or you know impacts the sensibility of a certain particular society she is actually asking to be raped and uh, to my mind uh, you know uh, whether uh, how a woman dresses is entirely again it's her own agency it's her own body it's she is the only person who has the right on that and it's time for men to understand boundaries uh, because uh, a particular person looks a certain way does not give the license for men to 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 beat her similarly it does not give them the license to violate her because like i said in the beginning uh, sexual assault and sexual uh, and rape is in within the bucket of violence uh, and sexuality and sexual acts are within the the domain of consenting adults so i hope yes, that is the question yeah, yeah. yes ma'am actually uh, i i just i uh, want to tell that like even that uh, ch uh, children who are uh, i mean they are being assaulted and uh, sexually tortured they are uh, like they they don't provoke anyone no ma'am like th these things uh, like the view of men or the rapists should change i mean the view only of the society should change i feel ma'am yeah you're absolutely right i couldn't agree with you more are there any other questions sir i have a question ma'am Good afternoon. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Neesh Ma'am. Hi, Ma'am. Ma'am, actually, I have doubt. Uh, not exactly like rape, but on um, virginity test that I made. Uh, like um, in many places they are doing it. Uh, I don't know whether it's legal or illegal. I tried to browse, but uh, not many are. The two finger test is not permitted. Yes, Ma'am. But still, yeah. some are doing that, and um, and before marriage. uh still some clinics are doing that is there is anything that we can uh, do to stop those things like if we see if we come across something like this uh, what can we do ma'am like so, this is uh, illegal how can we solve this see uh, under uh, in india uh, we have a fairly progressive uh, laws uh, uh, marital rape is still not an offense and sorry we didn't get to that part but uh, uh, we just leave marital rape aside for a moment but um, uh, any sort of violation of a woman's body uh, is uh, it, it would um, in in my book falls within the act, the act of violence so um, you know as individuals what can we do uh, as individuals of course you know if somebody sees an act which is uh, illegal it would be Uh, you know you could report it to the police so you know get you'll have to eventually get the victim to to uh, to report a matter of this nature to the police but uh, to everyone here i think uh, you know we should uh, we should take a more active role in uh, in educating ourselves and educating people around us 
to take a, a more to take more progressive uh, views you know and that's how society develops and i have another doubt to ma'am like in some traditions people are following that uh, on the day of uh, uh, wedding day is night that some uh, old people in the home like they used to uh, give the couple a white sheet and that old people used to um, like judge a girl like if she bleeds she is pure and if nothing happened like that and they will uh, definitely like insult the girl for the whole uh, like um, like for every, after marriage they will be insulting their girl for every day and a family too for not getting that uh, breaking of hymen and blood is this act like is there is there is anything to prevent these kind of acts so uh reshma again uh, the breaking of the hymen uh, and bleeding uh, i mean it's uh, there is no to my mind at least i, I don't know if uh, medically there is any correlation because uh, also many young girls break their hymen during doing sports and uh, cycling and you know things of that nature so to connect it to uh, to a sexual act may not be uh, may not be entirely correct uh, and a lot of uh, the breaking of the hymen may not be followed by bleeding and yeah, uh, she, she, she was she was asking about how uh, that culture is imposed on women only and how this entire society expect that uh, purity uh, when they get a girl into a marriage so sort of thing so how uh, how i mean i think see resma it's legally cannot uh, legally once it has come to the uh, uh, come to the floor of the government or the legal uh, you know authority it might be dealt with if it is not coming to the you know uh, uh, the floor of the government or legal authority it cannot be done it has to be reformed socially uh that's only i think really when if i yeah, am uh, mr rao is correct and it's also perpetuation of the entire cycle where you yeah, know yeah. to have a women of a particular character particular purity uh, this is all it, it, the, the entire uh, imposition of women and restriction is part of a perpetuated cycle and it's up to us women who have to break it yeah, yeah. I, I agree i agree with you at the educated woman educated woman has to take it as a responsibility of convincing those who may actually elderly who carried the kind of a tradition from the earlier ages and it is your responsibility i mean just you know if wherever the male uh, responsible to convince them or do some contribution they will do but i think it is primarily falls on the shoulders of the female educated to Uh, it actually it is done actually such culture is imposed on them it's uh, obligated on the young women by the elderly women only elderly women father mother in laws they only do that but that is only properly checked and uh, uh, by the male uh, agents i understand but however when it comes to the implementation of expecting the pure girl into the family is actually uh, uh, when it is the execution of that entire purity test and all is done by the female only so therefore uh, as an educated woman it falls on the shoulders of the educated woman to convince the mothers and mother in laws and uh, you know uh, uh, grandmothers in their homes that th there is nothing to do with purity and then you know sort of you know you seeing the blood on first night or something like that so you, uh, that convincing has to be done by the educated woman i think and men hopefully who are on our side yeah, absolutely 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 yeah any other questions thank you ma'am you're welcome reshma shanti ma'am shanti aida are you asking anything hey, you're not busy you're not audible shanti aida you're not audible actually mic wala sailan nenikira madam your mic is hello ah ah uh, uh, yes, wait wait uh, wait yes, yes. okay speaking with shanti shanti aida she is actually speaking but we are not able to yeah we are unable to hear miss yeah, aida yeah. unable to hear you we are not able to hear you aramuth uh, look at that what is the problem can you communicate with her 
I'm not able to hear. You just uh, type a message to Santi Aida saying that we are not able to hear her. Madam. Uh, I think Mr. Prasanna wanted to ask. Ah, I think you. Prasanna, you can ask. Uh, very good evening, ma'am. Uh, first of all, wonderful presentation with regarding to the topic. And uh, myself, I'm Prasanna, uh, PhD scholar in history from Bharatdasan University. So uh, I have many questions. Uh, I have four questions. Can I ask one by one or uh, can I list out the question? Which, whichever yeah, is. One by come. one, Mr. Prasanna. Okay, okay. The first question uh, is whether all the. Since we are discussing about rape, whether all the rape convicts are being properly sentenced. Because why I'm asking, uh, in India there are many cases. Let's uh, take an example of a famous uh, Nirbhaya case or uh, Jodi Singh. So in India's daughter, um, you know, one of the convicts of uh, one of the convicts, I believe Mukesh or uh, Akshay Thakur, I believe, he used to say uh, on record. He said that, see, we are going to uh, we are convicted, we are sentenced, and we are going to be hanged because the, the case of Nirbhaya is being so famous in India. And we know many cases. And he used to say some streets name around Delhi, and there one man is being raped or gang raped and burned alive. And he used to say many examples. But that rapist or that convict are not uh, hanged or not properly sentenced. Why we are being hanged? What's the reason? The punishment is not common. He used to say. This. So when I watched that, I was pretty surprised. So, so with regarding to that uh, reference, my first question is whether all the rape convicts are properly sentenced or not. That's my first question, madam. Um, please. Uh, so, Mr. Prasanna, uh, you know, uh, today's presentation, I wanted to only make in, in a very limited context of consent. But to answer your question on uh, on, so it's true that uh, the 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 kind of publicity that the Nirbhaya matter got, not all rape cases get. And uh, yes, there was a lot of public pressure as far as uh, Nirbhaya was concerned. In fact, uh, you may 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 not be aware, but after uh, when uh, the rape of Nirbhaya happened, two two judicial commissions uh, sat. Uh, one was Justice Usha Mehra's commission, which was to look at the safety of uh, women in the NCR area. And the other was uh, the Judicial Commission uh, of the late uh, Justice J.S. Varma. And uh, they had actually uh, recommended uh, landmark reforms, which um, actually came about in 2013 uh, to, to the rape laws. Uh, but uh, a lot of uh, so see the one of the biggest uh, issues in in getting conviction for uh, rape accused firstly most rapes are not even reported because of the fear of uh, uh, of shame that a victim goes through unfortunately those uh, that are reported uh, i don't even know how many in how many cases firs would be uh, actually uh, filed uh, where firs are done uh, you know uh, is there even uh, the, there is uh, an uh, evidence uh, to the uh, to the standard which would you know be able to get a conviction and then there's of course the appeal process and uh, and the manner in which so uh, yeah I I don't uh, I don't envisage that a lot of uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, rapes that are taking place uh, how many of them the accused actually get you know finally get convicted it couldn't be a lot oh, okay madam so what what do you, what's your opinion about his statement that's an unbiased documentary i believe because you know uh, if if hanging is the punishment for rape then it should be common his statement is like no, no, no. Mr. Pana, sorry uh, hanging is not the punish punishment for rape okay that penalty can be given if the death of the accused uh, takes place in an act uh, of rape Okay. And that is a 2013 amendment that has come about after the Justice uh, Vadma uh, committee sat. 
but in uh, in in general rape cases uh, the, the sentence is not the death penalty and in india we have uh, the standard for the death penalty in india is rarest of the rare Okay. Yeah, okay. Rarest, because that is there is the entire debate against the death penalty. Yes. So okay. only rarest, rarest of the rest, and the gruesomeness of the incident, the way you, uh, you know, you kill the kill the accused, and the gruesomeness and the torture, uh, if is considered to be very you know sort of you know unacceptable, then only the rarest of the rare cases uh, will be sent to the you know, hanging. That's it. Uh, okay, sir. Okay, ma'am. And the second question so in is, Nirbhaya's case, you see the brutality of the, yeah, of the uh, 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 was enormous, and she died. She eventually yeah. died, and that's how uh, you see the 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 four men were granted uh, the death penalty. It's not yeah, the yeah. norm. It's not the norm. Okay, okay. And the second question is, and um, you know, in connection to the Nirbhaya case, and. Um, under justice, there are human just that like volumes of reports and suggestions were submitted to the government of India. Uh, in that yes, to both both the commissions. Yes, that's correct. Okay, okay, okay. And so, wonder uh, what are the reforms activities that the government of India or uh, constitution have been taken after that instance? You know that the volumes uh, I saw was a it was very human, just like a tens of volumes of were uh, were given to the government of India constitution. Wonder what kind of reports or what kind of uh, reform activities have been taken in order to prevent these kind of activities in future uh, by the justice or uh, wonder after that incident. That's the second question I want to ask. So, Mr. Prasanna, again, uh, just to uh, the the two commissions that sat. Uh, Justice Usha Mehra's commission was looking at the preventive uh, aspect of and for safety of women in the NCR area. So uh, I actually was privileged to be part of that commission with Justice Usha Mehra. Uh, and one of the things uh, that, that would be of interest to you, you know, if many of you may have seen the MySafe app uh, on your phones, no. uh, if you're no. familiar with it. We no, had actually, that recommendation had come from Justice Usha Mehra's commission. Uh, oh, Nirbhaya Act. Nirbhaya Act. Sorry. Nirbhaya Act. Uh, yes. So the the amendment, the twenty thirteen amendments that you're talking about, that those uh, came about because of Justice Varma's uh, commission, and he did absolutely path breaking work. He is the same judge uh, who was the judge uh, in um, the, uh, that laid down the Vishakha guidelines, Vishakha versus the state of Rajasthan. Uh, they, in fact, uh, um, the uh, the criminal amendments, uh, almost all the amendments that had been recommended by uh, Justice Varma came about as part of the uh, the amendments. So they had, uh, in fact, enhanced. Uh, um, uh, the punishment, the, the the death penalty came about as part of the uh, 2013 amendments. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And the third question is, you know, the definition talks about, uh, you know, vagina, the rape about female, but it does not include male. I think so. No. Uh, the rape. It's not a. It's not gender neutral. No, e, right. no. Seventy-five is not gender neutral. No. Okay, but uh, you know, uh, for the past years, I came across the newspaper that the male is also being raped by male or by woman. There are some cases I have some reference, I believe, in the newspaper. So, so, but it was not included in the definition of the constitution. So it needs to be amended. I think so. No, no, not the constitution, the Indian Penal Code, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, see, 377 uh, continues to be on the uh, 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 continues to be there, but the the bit on the consensual part. So uh, anything on that is unnatural sex. Unfortunately, uh, uh, for uh, for men would uh, go under 377. Okay. So okay. Right that rape should be. Uh, gender neutral and you know uh, particularly uh, yeah I mean rape of men can happen it's not uh, that it cannot it's a minority one okay 
And the fourth question is, uh, what's the solution to this problem? Because it's it's been a, it's like an accident, like every day. There is a, there is a one rape case, here is a one, case, one rape case. So wonder, what's the problem? Whether our constitution is not enough or not strong to protect the woman, or whether our social structure is strong, or whether our education system is wrong, because it has been happening, uh, prevailing all over the world, especially in India. Like I believe um, in 2017, there was a census report, like for every 15 minutes, a woman is being raped by men. There are many examples. We are perfect at the census report. But wonder what's the solution, uh, since you are an advocate, uh, uh, I like to hear the solution to this problem, where we are wrong and how we can protect our woman because it may be happen in our proximity area unless it, ha it it's been ha it's not happening to me it may be uh, it's not um, a, a personal one you know i yeah. like to hear yours that's my uh, question mr prasanna the thing is that uh, we have uh, so there, there there is still some work to be done as far as the legislation uh, on rape, law, rape rape laws is concerned but that said, uh, for example, and, and, and I'll come to that in a minute, which I've been wanting to talk about, which is marital rape. But, I, but uh, let me step back a minute. I think the two most important things are uh, education. And, and with education, uh, the changes that have to be brought about in social conditioning. Uh, in the patriarchy is, you know, the, this entire cycle that we were talking about, that one thing plays into the next, unless and until men uh, and young, we have to teach our little boys and little girls the distinction between a sexual act and the act of violence. That the moment consent goes away, it it then is no longer a sexual act. It it, it then goes into to becoming an act of violence. Little boys have to be taught that no is no. It there's and little girls have to be taught that you stop playing coy. Just stop this uh, thing about you know uh, maybe not you. you you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be convinced by another party to enter into a, a sexual act. You have to take agency and control and say, do I want this or I don't want it, and be clear in what we are saying. And men have to be able to kind of draw the line, saying no means no. But the, the, this is all has to happen with you know we have to talk to our little children. This this thing about you know we are not going to have any sex education for our kids. Why? What is this Indian context that we keep talking about that, you know, people are going to be, uh, we're going to ruin society. You're not going to ruin society if uh, if things are openly spoken about. It is not a sign of good society that we violate our women. It's not. So uh, that was to, to your point. Now, let me just extend that for a moment, which I've been wanting to talk about was is marital rape. If you go back to the very first slide, uh, and if I can just read that out to you, the exception on the definition of okay. rape is sexual intercourse by a man with his own wife. The wife not being under the age of 15 is not rape. So uh, this age has now become 18. But what we're then saying is uh, that you're legalizing rape. It's in the statute book. And the, re the reason why we are prepared to legalize rape is because there is the fear that, oh, uh, you see, every man, woman is going to turn around and accuse her husband of rape. Uh, no, because uh, are we then saying that because we don't have the wherewithal uh, to be able to take into account evidence that may be presented by a wife against her husband, that there is rape, we don't want to deal with the problem. We want to be like ostriches that put our heads in the sand. Are we then saying that a woman who's married has no agency? She has no right to consent? So these are all issues. And I uh, thank you for asking all these questions, Mr. Prasanna. It's, these are important uh, issues that have to be discussed. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, indeed. Well, are there any other questions? Sandy Aida. Yeah, yeah, who is that? Abhi Sundar. Sir, uh, I'm Abhiram. Hi, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, madam. Hello, Ms. Yeah. Sundar. How are you? 
I'm fine, madam. I'm Abhirami uh, from Second Year Integrated Bardas University. Oh, okay, okay. I have a question about the uh, the recent case in Zomato. Ah, uh, recent case, Bangalore, Bangalore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, Miss Sundar. I haven't followed the Zomato case. I've just seen it only on on the news, and I don't think it's a consent issue. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, yes. I take a pass on that question. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think we can talk about it. It's not a big deal. Okay, Ms. Sundar, you want to talk about the I Honestly, I don't. I, I haven't followed the case too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah ask the question. Abhiram, ask the question. We'll see if we can answer it. <laughs> uh, sir, I don't know what I'm saying, sir. நான் தாக்கப்பட்ட அப்படினு சொல்ற மாதிரி வீடியோ போட்டுருந்தாங்க. ஆனா வந்து நியூஸ்ல வந்து அந்த பையன் வந்து என்ன சொல்லிருந்தாங்க அப்படினு சொன்னா பத்து வந்து அவங்க தான் தாங்க நடந்துக்கிட்டாங்க அப்படிங்கற மாதிரி சொல்லிருந்தாங்க. ம் அதுதான் சார் அவங்க வந்து அவங்க செஞ்ச இது அவங்க மேல தப்பு. ம் இருந்தாலும் வந்து அவங்க வந்து அத சொல்லாம இந்த மாதிரி அவங்க தப்பு பண்ணிட்டாங்க அப்படிங்கற மாதிரி சோஷியல் மீடியால சொல்லிருக்காங்கல சார். Yeah, that's what I'm saying. See, uh, uh, it's not that uh, in all all cases. Even if say whatever they say, both when when the accused is uh, you know uh, a case is reported, when the male uh, male is actually refusing to accept the you know uh, the blame, so it has to take go to the police or the court, and what is the truth will be decided by the. Court, court of law. So they can accuse of each other, saying that no, it is not me. No, it is not me. So what is the truth will be decided by the court. So it has to go to the court. It is not that uh, women. Uh, there, there are notorious women. So it's not that all women are <laughs> incapable of committing crimes. Uh, but maybe you know, hundred percent. If at all the woman is at, uh, wrong. it will be proved in the court of law so it's not that uh, she may not be wrong or he may not be wrong so accusations can be made but it cannot be outrightly decided that no he is right and she is right it has to go to the court has to prove uh, what is wrong and right based on the evidence that's it okay sir thank you So I think uh, I have a couple of questions. Okay. About, uh, yeah, if you uh, see about this uh, about this uh, misconception of facts. Actually, uh, no. Does it uh, uh, to do with uh, uh, with the vulnerability of the woman, and uh, then the social position also comes into play. The economic position also comes into play. So the uh, woman falling victim of the misconception of facts may not be uh, the degree of it uh, may not be same across all sections. Uh, then uh, then she uh, then we take the woman you uh, know agent woman agency uh, across all sections women may not be vulnerable. There is some amount of radicality in a capable woman in some amount uh, and some amount of vulnerability in a woman who is not from the you know well settled economically socially position so uh, do we need to see that uh, when we decide the consent uh, sort of thing no so on the misconception of fact mr rao if you recall what the supreme court has said it is this is not a one size fit all yeah. uh, we're going to see it on a case to case basis we're going to see if indeed uh, there was uh, uh, the 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 promises were made in a manner that they were an attempt to misrepresent one side mm. so i think yeah. that's the correct standard because uh, particularly in in uh, you know in in areas where it's not black and white mm. you can't uh, have a, a set standard yeah No, I think see, uh, I think see the 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 class when you talk about the woman as a class, uh, a poor woman or the upper class woman, a middle class woman. When you take the woman, you know, in class, I think there is certain amount of you know, ability, strength uh, to counter the you know misconception of facts. 
So, uh, Mr. Rao, I wouldn't make a, a, a blanket assertion of that nature. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, we're getting into then, uh, uh, again, you know, what were the facts? For example, in this particular case, uh, which was um, the case of uh, Mahmood Farooqi, both people were educated. Uh, and in that particular instance, uh, the way I see it, uh, mm. The woman did say no. Mm. She said a categorical yeah. no. Uh, mm. And you can't, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, no matter how educated a woman may be and how, uh, how elitist one may be, uh, there is in a situation where your safety is at risk. Yeah, and I, I think thought, Time and time again, uh, women saying, you know, this happened. We froze in that moment. We did not know how to react. Uh, mm -hmm. You cannot underplay shame. How much shame is, uh, is, it goes with uh, an act of sexual violation. So, uh, yeah. you know, they, they, there are circumstances and there are circumstances. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think, uh, say... I would have been uh, happier, Mr. Rao. I would have been mm -hmm. honestly happier in the case of Mahmood Faruqi if the court was to say that, look, uh, there was a categorical no, and the fact that he continued uh, to perpetuate the, the actions, those were completely uncalled for. Maybe it got confusing for him, uh, you know, when there was the entire going along with it, uh action but mm -hmm. uh, and you know by the way sorry i i did not mention one thing uh, in the case of mehmood faruqi the court actually goes on to say that she was a stellar witness now the supreme court has held that in cases of rape where the only evidence that one has is is a stellar witness uh where the victim is a stellar witness there is no requirement for a for, for further corroborative evidence. So in this case, the court actually had commented that the victim was a stellar witness. Now, in those circumstances, uh, I would have been happier if the court had said that, you know, because the standard of proof that is required uh, is beyond a reasonable doubt, and perhaps because of circumstances, uh, you know, it isn't uh, that but uh, we tend to believe the 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 statement of the of the victim. But to yeah. go into a space where you say you know yes maybe mean yes uh, no means yes. To my yeah. mind that is problematic. Yeah, yeah, my point is actually the woman's ability comes from the social woman's ability of saying no or withdrawing from the consent in the middle of intercourse or whatever. Or relationship, I think it comes from the social background, the power of the woman, you know, as an agency, woman as an independent agency, without anybody's help, it will be much more stronger, especially a woman comes from the upper class and middle class compared to that of the poor woman. So what I'm trying to ask you is that, do we consider the social position and economic position of the woman, which influences the very idea of consent or withdrawal of consent? I think that it would certainly play a role, and I don't want to underplay that. But at the same time, one has to has to take into account safety. That safety, I think, one safety point. Safety is I a said huge that. thing, you know, that can never be undermined because you uh, lots of, uh, and I can tell you this as a woman. Uh, primary aspect that would go into is: Will I be able to get out of this room safe? Yeah. You know, so that cannot be underplayed. Yeah, I certainly, I certainly agree with you. When it comes to the safety, probably that is the one thing. But in all circumstances, is the safety only determining the consent of a woman or no, withdrawal of the consent? That's what, uh, also, yeah, that's I'm, I'm saying that, uh, uh, see, violation of women transcends classes, it transcends your economic status. What is your opinion about women's Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Santi Aida was trying to ask a question. Her question is, what is your opinion about uh, uh, sex education given in the schools? I think it's absolutely a must. Yeah, yeah. 
it's a it, it, there's just no question in my mind about it okay i think uh, uh, see given the uh, given the change in conditions and circumstances radicality that is being uh, you know <coughs> emerging from the women agency i mean i am not submissive any more kind of a statement is openly given and that is to be given i think you know you need not have to be submissive all the time so given that the post modernity of the culture and all do we see that radicality of women is increasing so that is an appreciative sort of a culture or a, an a state of women so the radical woman is very important to uh, reject and uh, you know reject, reject the consent and uh, withdraw the consent at any point in time say yeah, as you saw if if you, as you said if i said no no you cannot impose your wish on me so for that do you mean to say uh, do you say that the cultural radicality is very important modernity is very important uh, uh, so uh, i wouldn't use the word radicality but i, I would mm -hmm. certainly you know i want to see uh, uh, women become you know uh, sexual equality is a very very important aspect for uh, women to achieve equality so economic and sexual uh, equality are both exceedingly important mm -hmm. yeah okay so if there are no other questions we would like to say thanks to thank you very much Bye. thank you everyone <laughs> for patiently listening yeah yeah so we are very thankful to you for helping us and you know, educating in this area we are very poor in this area certainly and uh, different aspects of consent and then uh, resulted uh, judicial pronouncements and reforms uh, after that so we are very happy uh, to hear you uh, today thank you very much pail chawla thank you thank you very much mr rao for having me thank you thank you okay good evening good evening thank you yeah.